My name is Camila Tablas and I go to the Academia Británica Costa Teleca in El Salvador. And which grade, which grade are you in? I'm currently in 11th grade, I'm fresh to the IB program. Ah, wonderful. Um, what do you think is good about this school? I actually wake up every morning and I'm actually happy to come to school because the IB and also the I2CSC gave us the option of choosing to study what we like to develop our personal interests. And I think that's one of the things I love mo most about school is that they give you the option to be yourself. Because in other grades, you're, you are still exploring what you like, what you love, what you're good at. But in further years, you become yourself and you know what you love, you know what, what you want to study. And Values-based education, or VBE, is so much more than another model or mode of education for student learning. To me, it's about the creation of a harmonious, peaceful and respectful learning environment that has the ability to positively influence all areas of pupils, teachers and school life. I really think that all schools should adopt a values-based education approach. Children will learn and model the positive examples their teachers set and if a respectful, peaceful and harmonious environment can be created in every school through VBE, then it really will be positively life-changing for all students, as it was for me. Hello and welcome to this, our third session of this fantastic conference. Um, I'm Sue Jones, I'm a values-based education consultant and I'm thrilled to be here this morning introducing these wonderful people. Some I know, some I don't, but I'm thrilled to be with you all. Um, Hello to Julie Rees, who I know really well, who's head teacher at Ledbury Primary School in Herefordshire, and to Charlotte Hickerton, who's head teacher at St Peter's Gouts. Now that's wrong, isn't it, Charlotte? <laughs> but it's close to that. Um, and to Don Brister, who is the founder of a wonderful charity called Don't Lose Hope, and I hope he's going to tell us a little bit more about that later. And to Sharji Matthew, who's talking to us all the way from India today. He's the principal at Divine Child International School in Gujarati, India. And to Jason O'Rourke from Washington Academy in uh, Lincolnshire. So it's great to be with you all. And I can't wait. I'm really excited. We've heard such wonderful speakers so far. And I know that you are going to be inspiring too. No pressure there. I've been asked to just start us off, warm us up as it were. I can't do a reflection in that super way that Jane does, but we're going to have a little bit of a reflection on um, my thoughts on what value should we have today? What should be our value of the day for the conference? Um, and I did take a little bit of time to think about this. Um, I noticed that in Neil's blog, his value for this whole week is solidarity because of people coming together to actually uh, celebrate the values that we all hold so dear. And it's just wonderful to have people coming from so far away. Uh, and as I reflected on that and all the wonderful values that we are thinking about today in different ways, I thought about all these people from diverse places. And I actually made a note um, because Nigel shared with us where all of you are coming from. And I know it's not a complete list and I know that Sue mentioned it earlier, but I think it's worth hearing again because it is just so mind blowing. We have attendees from Australia, Brazil, Cameroon, Canada, India, Ireland, Italy, Kazakhstan, Malta, Morocco, Nepal, Nigeria, Saudi Arabia, South Africa, Sweden, Taiwan, Thailand, the Netherlands, Turkey and Zambia. And I do apologise not to mention the United Kingdom too. I do apologise if I haven't mentioned your country. Please put it in the comments and I will mention you later. But it's just amazing. When I thought about all those people coming together, I was drawn to the value of harmony. 
and some of you may be signing up to a workshop later on this afternoon about harmony um, led by Richard Dunn. Harmony is agreement, accord, harmonious relations and consistent, orderly or pleasing arrangement of parts. And to me, as I was thinking about it, funnily enough, I was thinking about harmony as a collection of different threads, different colours, thicknesses, textures, lengths, all of us bringing our own experience to this special day to produce a whole wonderful effect. And doesn't that match beautifully with Anne's analogy of the golden thread? So here we are, values is the golden thread that's bringing our tapestry together. It's, it's not quite such an obvious analogy as the musical one, but again, here we are, all coming with our different languages, our different timbres, our different rhythms, but we're all together because fundamentally we believe in the power of positive human values to actually change the world through influencing our young people. And I hope that you will all agree with me that that is a suitable value for today, but be great to hear from some of the rest of you in the comments today about what you feel is the main value, the core value of our conference today. Now, it's my very great pleasure and privilege to introduce you to our first speaker from this session. Shaji is going to talk to us about how he has been a champion for values in India um, and has developed VBE in his schools over the last, I think, Shaji, three or four years. Is that right? Thank you, Shaji. It's an absolute joy to have you with us today. Thank you very much. Good morning to all. Uh, and good evening from India. It's four o'clock here. I thank uh, the Almighty and the entire VP team for giving me this opportunity to share my experience with the VBE in India. The journey is not very easy in India because religious aspects, socioeconomic status are the biggest challenges in India. But what exactly the famous writer Paulo Coelho says, if you want to do something, the entire universe conspires to help you. And if you want to be better, then you can see the people around you getting better. So um, introduction of VBE in our school, we, uh, we decided a lot of things, but you know, we understood that VBE is not just for the children, but it is for all, unless and until we are going to involve the entire stakeholders, say it's parents, teachers, um, assistant teachers, cafeteria people, security guard, whomever it is going to be, everyone should be there. Then only values-based education is going to be implemented fruitfully. So we decided to roll out a plan, an action plan, where the involvement of all the adults were ensured. We conducted various workshops, brainstorm sessions, individual workshop for teachers, students, then for the parents and even for the families to sensitize the importance of values. And finally, we started doing it in 2017, April. And wonderfully, within two years, I'm so proud to say that our school has been accredited with enhanced quality marks for VB. And thanks a lot for the entire guidance from there. But I can tell you, this pandemic, this lockdown has been a blessing in disguise. When all the children are sitting at home, missing their school, missing their teachers, missing their friends, they're spending most of their time in virtual world, but our teachers are there with them for 40 minutes per week to talk to them and to understand what, is, what they feel and just for normal discussions. And it was really giving a lot of uh, confidence into them that they are, we are there with them. So, and another important thing which happened in, during this lockdown is 
parents are also sitting with the children, especially in the smaller classes. When this value education is going on, they are also there. So there is no need to go for a separate session for them. They are already there in the session, which is really giving a lot of inputs. They are also getting involved themselves in the activities and everything, even in the, uh, the, the result is very clear now. And I can, I understand that children see, children do. So it is our responsibility to become the role models. So we took modeling and inner curriculum to a great extent. We have taken a lot of interest for that, focused a lot on it, uh, because role modeling is an important thing. Everywhere they see the adults. So more actions, because we know that action speaks louder than words. So we included more actions, more activities to reinforce that values. And the result is there. Simply, I can tell you, we can take it as simple as a gardening process. For gardening, we need a patch of land. And we need the best quality seeds. And the best patch of land is with you, the school. And the seeds and the saplings are with you, values. Just prepare this land, prepare this school to plant these values, these seeds. Of course, we know that just planting will not help you. We have to be there watching it, watering it. Sometimes a lot of weeds, unwanted plants can be there. And some or other things may happen which may hinder the progress of our mission. We have to weed it. We have to pluck those unwanted plants. If plan A doesn't work, go with the plan B. Exactly what Miss Sue used to say. You know, fail, but fail better. With a growth mindset, go ahead. And I know that the harvest is going to be sweeter and bountiful than what you expect. Of course, you have to work a lot. You have to push. Sometimes this watering is important. Encouragement, appreciation, everything is important for the growth. And finally, you can see the fruits coming in. It may take sometimes, it took around nine months, we saw no fruits and we were a little disappointed, but we were encouraged to do it exactly like we cannot see a plant growing, but it is growing. That is what is which is happening with the uh, values based, based education. The result will be there. We have to work patiently, exactly like what the great poet Robert Frost says, miles to go before you sleep, miles to go before you sleep. Thank you for hearing me. Thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Shaji. Your optimism is just contagious. I love the fact that you have said the pandemic has some good points. That's so good to hear. And, and also so good to hear that you kept going, you had resilience, you kept going against all the challenges and you've went through. Thank you so much for being such a great champion for VBE. Thank you. Uh, and now I'm going to turn to Charlotte and ask you to talk about empowering a community of hope, which is um, very close to, to Dom's title, in fact, isn't it? It's, uh, so I can't wait to hear about your community of hope. Thank you, Charlotte. Okay. Um, yeah, I'd like to just share with you some of the things that um, I've come across on my values journey. Um, so, um, yeah, I'm head teacher at St. Peter at Gouts and I've been head teacher for six years and I joined the school at a really challenging time. Um, so, um, so the school's in Lincoln, it's an inner city school, um, it's about 250 children. But when I joined the school, it was at such a tragic time. There'd been two deaths in the school community, really tragic ones linked to domestic violence and mental health. Staff morale was on the absolute floor. Um, the school was in an Ofsted category. Pupil attainment was on the floor. And add to that all of the difficulties of an inner city school, which was serving um, a, quite a deprived area. Now, 50% of our children don't speak English as a first language, 
which I see as absolutely wonderful, um, but not everyone does. So an area of huge racial tension, the mosque was burnt down that's 200 meters from the school. So a really challenging area. And as a 35 year old person who thought that she knew it all, I was taking on all this um, and I was woefully ill-equipped, shall I say. Uh, but thank goodness I'd had some experience with values-based education as I um, helped the school at that time. And I just thought to myself, what does this school need? What does this community need? It needs shared values. And I knew I could get into the children and the staff, but I was hoping that I might be able to have some impact on the wider community as well. Uh, so it's interesting what's been said about lockdown because for us it's been brilliant to kind of reassess and say okay it's six years in now has our values-based education had the impact that we wanted on our school community and actually when we were physically not together as a community it was wonderful to see that the values were held firm and we were able to support our families during lockdown um, so yeah there has been some good to come out of the pandemic I think um, so I challenged myself to think about if any of you came to see St Peter's now what you might see um, and you would see, you'd see like the values displays, you'd see beautiful cushions with the names of the values on, um, you might see the values lessons that we do, we do um, raffle tickets, we talk the language of values, but that's really quite surface, isn't it? So that's what you'd see on the surface. So I just had a walk yesterday and saw what was going on deeper um, in, in terms of our values. And I saw children obviously displaying the values. We had a new child to our school and the way that they were welcomed by the others was so uplifting. I then had a letter on my desk from Lily, um, who was seven, and she said, in my values lesson, we were talking about hope, and I think that we need to be doing more of the eco agenda, and we need to be raising money, and we need to not be using glitter at Christmas, and all these different things. I thought, yes, it's not me that's championing the values, it's the children. Um, then we have a meeting every Friday morning. So we've had that this morning and it's called a safe and well meeting. And our school talks about all the children that we're worried about on a Friday morning. So we all logged in and um, we talked about a little boy in reception who's doing an awful lot of swearing at the minute. <laughs> so not values behavior, but we saw that little window into that little boy's life, but we didn't talk about it in a punitive way. So we didn't talk about that child swearing we talked about the fact that the family is um, both parents are recovering addicts. They're struggling with drug addiction. We talked about all of the wider things that's going on in that little boy's life. And we talked with respect and we talked with compassion about that family and that little boy and how we were going to positively help him and the whole family. So we talked in hopeful values language. We talked about a little girl um, who's um, struggling with her toileting, but we didn't talk about that. We talked about the fact that her dad has got stage four cancer, mum is on the breadline. We talked in the way of the values of how we're gonna help that whole family. Because sometimes when you try and help a child, it needs to be bigger than that. It needs to be values for the whole family. So, and so that's what you'd hopefully see if you saw St. Peter's. Um, as I looked around the office, I saw things like uh, there was a pack of nappies for one of our families who's had a baby and they're struggling. Um, I saw a food shop which is going out. But I saw the way that since lockdown, we are supporting our whole families. Um, and I think that that's really embedded values when they snowball beyond what I do. So I haven't directed any of that work because now we've got values practitioners. Like, for example, since Black Lives Matter, they're doing Black History Month, but it hasn't come from me. It feels like our values have snowboard. And I loved what you said earlier about the um, the growing of the flowers. Um, and for me, I've got this little picture of a snowball and it's like the values started as a little snowball that I kind of rolled up with that hope and that positivity. And then it's just been added to and it's on its way now and it's gathering pace. And I think as school leader, 
as school leaders, we have to be really careful, don't we, um, about what we put in our snowball. So particularly at the minute, I'm tired, I'm grumpy, I'm ready for half term. So I could put negativity and despair and hopelessness in my snowball. And oh my goodness me, that would roll, wouldn't it? Because values are catching. And we've just got to make sure that our positive values are being added to and snowballing. And wouldn't it be wonderful if our values were out of control in our schools? Thank you so much, Charlotte. I could listen to you for ages. And I love the snowball analogy. I wish some artist at the end of the day would, would make us some sort of wonderful poster of all these different analogies, you know, with the garden and the threads and snowballs. I, I can see something coming together, but I don't have the skills to do it. So if anybody is out there and artistic, please uh, take up the challenge. Uh, thank you so much. Um, we're now going to turn to, let me see, Dom, I believe, who, um, I don't know if you're going to tell us where you are, Dom, but I'm fascinated. And you are going to talk to us about um, values in the community again, are you not? Dom, are you able to unmute? Yeah, thanks, Sue. Hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm unsure if you can. I'm. Uh... Yeah, I've unmuted now. All good. First time for this. Um, I'm currently in a minibus uh, sat in the service station on the a new A14. So anyone that's driven up and down the A14 will know that this new service station is nice and busy because it's an easy bus. So, yeah, I with my wife, we set up Don't Lose Hope about two, three years ago as a counselling service. Um, mental health provisions, uh, Charlotte and Jason, uh, fellow Lincolnshire here, we're down in Bourne. Um, mental health provisions within schools were, were falling apart. There, there was nothing available. Uh, my wife was in and out of schools as a school counsellor. Um, and then we set up a hub and we set it up around a cafe, which is kind of, it, it was a, we, we thought, we thought there were loads and it, was, it wasn't a novel idea, but we've had a lot of people coming towards us. So basically, we've got a cafe at the front of a building. We converted an old bank and in the, the, all the profits from the cafe go to fund all the counselling services that go on in the back. Um, it started off as people thinking it was a mental health cafe. So people could only come into the cafe if they had mental health issues. And it's taken six or seven months, but over, sort of now we've been open a year we're it's it's ridiculous and sadly with with covid we've had to take a couple of tables out but we've we're now getting bookings and we're, we're full we're full from nine till four every day uh, people know it's you know it's decent i'm not selling it. it's decent coffee decent cakes everything's homemade um in fact this morning i made the pancake batter before i flew down here um but it's 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 grown and and charlotte's talked about charlotte's talked about the snowball effect and and charji's talking talking about the the garden we've in the last six months we've now taken on a community garden and within that community garden we've grown all the fruit and vegetables that we now make the soups with in the cafe that people then go and eat and that's run by volunteers um we've had thousands of pounds of donations from local companies and businesses and tradesmen and we've now built a man shed um, and we're affiliated to the uk men's shed association um we've now got 650 members uh, we haven't even finished the shed yet um, and we've uh, been asked to run as an ambassador team for Men's Shed UK uh, to sort out the mental health or, or to support, sorry, the mental health within um, within gentlemen, ideally, because men don't talk. Um, I had a 24-hour walk planned that we had over 1,200 walkers. Sadly, it got cancelled. Um, so, yeah, we've then adapted, which is why I'm here this morning. I was supposed to be doing a workshop this afternoon, but I had to apologise to Sue. Um, needs must um so in the back you can see hopefully i've converted the minibus during covid we converted our minibus to a mobile shop and we traveled around families that couldn't get out um and every seat had about four different items on and we just took them to people who couldn't make it and 
we've now opened a gift shop. There's no gift shop in Bourne. So we've got local artists, local makers, local crafters who build things, make things, design things. Um, so although it's a charity shop, it's not a secondhand shop. Everything is everything is new. Um, there is no gift shop. And suddenly we've been open four days and what we thought was a month's worth of stock has sold out. So I've had to fly down to Cambridge this morning to basically restock. Um, but usually if I'm doing a talk like this, it was very nice. Sue, Sue sort of cajoled me into a couple of other things. And I would make a really nice plan. Um, Sue knows that I'm probably lying about that. I just wing it. Um, after 15 years of teaching, I kind of get an idea of what I'm going to go with. And I thought I've got no pieces of paper to make notes. So I've got a, a little scrap of paper that I think was a receipt from this morning. Um, and one thing that Shaji said that that kind of really resonated was about flowers growing. And it's something that I talk about. I still... I'm out of teaching now after 15 years. I'm now full time with the charity. Um, but within the garden, when I go into primary schools and I do sort of support consultations and things, we talk about when a flower doesn't grow, you don't pull the flower out or abuse the flower. You sort out the soil so that next time the flowers will grow. And, and Charlotte talking about the snowball is really simple we wanted a small cafe with two counselling rooms. We've now got a massive cafe with eight counselling rooms, 24 counsellors, and we're seeing 320 clients a week. And it's just bigger and bigger. In the newspaper this morning, we ended up in the local paper yesterday and we're in national paper today. And we're not, we're not promoting it. We're not selling it. It's, it's just happening. And I can't see the notes. It'll probably say I've got one more minute left. I can't see. But I just want to talk really quickly about five P's. And if you're in marketing, you've probably heard about these five P's. And every group, every school that you have, every pupil that you have, I'm trying to drum this in at primary school level. You've got someone in the group who's a pilot. You've got someone who's a participant. You've got someone who's a passenger, a protester and a prisoner. And within every group, someone's going to lead it. Someone's going to follow. Someone's going to help out. Someone's going to say, oh, I'm not quite sure. Someone's going to drag their heels. And every working table you've got, there's one of these. One thing that I want to try and put in now is those posters, the people who just want to get involved to post on social media. They just want to get involved to highlight the fact that they're involved. Are they actually doing anything to help your values journey? I've seen too many people, and this is a massive, I've been a massive supporter of, of VBE since I met Neil, oh, maybe five, six years ago. And someone at the conference last year spoke about values being lived and not laminated. As long as the people that you are working with are living the values, they don't have to be screaming about it all the time. They need to demonstrate it. And as Charlotte said, she went round her school and she could see on the surface. But when it's embedded and you get kids coming to you and talking about it, that's when you know it's working. Anyone can put up a really nice poster. And Sue, just to let you know, if you send me an email with the um, labels that you want, I've got a little bit of time in the next couple of weeks. I can get some things drawn out for you so you can actually have them as posters. So we've got we've got people within the charity who will do that for you. Um, but just make sure that when you're promoting these values, you're promoting them and able to demonstrate them, which I know that everyone here will be able to do. But if you're trying to help other people, just promote that we want more pilots and we want more participants and we want more protesters. We want more people to turn around and say, actually, are we doing the right thing? Because a protester isn't bad as long as they're driving the train in the right way. I am sadly going to have to sign out here after I've said my goodbyes because I've got to get this stuff back to the shop because otherwise we've got no money to be able to support more counselling sessions. So thanks a lot. So thank you, everyone else, and really well done. Thank you so much, Dom. Just listen to me say thank you. <laughs> and, and he's gone. But yeah, what a great, inspiring person he is. And doesn't he just embody the value of altruism? Everything he does is, is for values, is for other people. Fantastic. Thank you, Dom. I'm sure you'll see the recording. Um, and now I, I realise that we are getting a little bit short of 
time, but we do have until 12.25. So Julie and Jason, don't feel that you have to cut short. You're fine. We just will cut short the, the questions just a little bit, but don't worry about it, please. So feel free. So I'm going to ask um, Julie Reese, who's the head teacher at Legby Primary School in Herefordshire, to talk about values perspectives in the community. Over to you, Julie. Thank you. Thank you, Sue lovely to be here today and see some very familiar faces as well as some new faces. Um, I've been very fortunate to be involved with values-based education since 2003 when I had the pleasure of sharing a journey with Bridget Knight from Norfolk all the way to Herefordshire where she passionately spoke about the impact of values-based education coming from Oxfordshire. And at the time, I was leading a small primary school, which actually Sue Jones did take over after me. And um, we introduced values. And with the help of Neil, that's where my story began. I, my second headship started in 2006 here at Lebby Primary School. I just want to reassure you all, um, you saw Jacob earlier, one of my teachers, sitting in this same space. This is not real, OK? <laughs> this... I wish it was, but this is our PPA room and this is where we sit when we're planning and um, the scene just lifts our spirits a little bit. It's a, a scene of positivity. Uh, so since 2006, I've been head teacher here and I love my school. I'm in a very privileged position that I've never woken up any day since I've been in this job of teaching and thought I don't want to go to school today. So I'm really, really passionate about my job and about values-based education. But interestingly, throughout COVID, throughout the pandemic, I had a change of perspective on some of the actions that we took with regard to our values. And they made me think a little bit differently. And I've just written down here, perhaps I'm one of the protesters that Don was just talking about because I re-evaluated how we did many of our um, actions to show our values. And after working with values for so long, obviously they become embedded, um, but this opportunity to reflect was really powerful. So I just want to talk about 10 things that we've looked at differently since March, since we went into lockdown and now we're back at school, and talk about the impact that we are feeling within our community and with each other. So I'm going to start with that quote. If you always do what you always did, you'll always get what you always got. The Albert Einstein quote. And I think it would serve us all well to think about that quote every year, because you can get into a routine with having the same values on a rolling um, program year after year after year. We've changed our values, actually, since Richard Dunn came to our school and we worked with him on the Harmony curriculum. And we now have B values. This month, it's about being resilient. In September, we were talking about being determined. So that's at the forefront of these 10 things I want to talk to you about. So the first one I want to talk to you about is what, as values educators, we use as leaders to really share our passion about values. And that's our assemblies. I love doing assembly. Um, I have 500 children here at Lebury Primary School. When they come into assembly with their teachers, it's, it's magical. I love the silence. I love the um, integrated work that we, we do during that assembly. But on that first Monday during lockdown, I realised I couldn't do assemblies as I've always done them. And I chose not to do an assembly from my office. I chose actually to walk into the countryside near my house and I think my first assembly was um, about the boy who cried wolf. And I told that story in front of a flock of sheep because I wanted the children to get a sense of what was really happening, that this was going to be different. And I wanted them to experience me in my, being my authentic self. So boldness and authenticity really came through as new values for me in assemblies. And rather thinking about the stories that I'd always shared, I thought about the stories which were very current as we went through lockdown and where I was telling my assembly from so that the children could engage with that. The second um, element that we thought about differently was pupil well-being. 
Now, not being able to be in school was a challenge, but we immediately set up a wellbeing team made up of various people in the school who checked in with all of our children every week. The teachers were having that one-to-one um, and they knew which children they were concerned about. But the wellbeing team would then go a step further and be knocking on people's doors with food parcels, food vouchers, or just with a smile and saying, is everything okay? And for me, that's the value of connecting. The, it's a value I hadn't really thought about before, but connecting during this time was just so important. Some of our families did not leave their house during this time. I wanted them still to feel connected to our community. And within that, I wanted our children to be well mentally, emotionally, and physically. And I think out of all of those, the physical aspect worried me because many of the children were just gaming or on their computers much of the time. And we all know that physical well-being has a positive impact on our emotional health and on our mental health. So we have worked really, really hard on physicality and being physical as a new value in order to help our well-being. The third aspect I want to talk to you is about the learning. We have all learned, and I'm sure my, my fellow head teachers here on this webinar will say that we know that less is more. Quality over quantity every single time. We've come back knowing that we've got uh, quite a while to get the curriculum fully up and running and we had step up september happen and step up september was mad it was crazy we were trying to do far too much but just by stopping looking at our values from a different perspective and saying what impact is this having on us as a school we checked in changed our perspective and we've changed our curriculum and within that We've taken time to deeply listen to each other, not surface listen anymore. We're listening to our heart and we're listening to each other at a more connected level. The fourth one I want to talk to you about is how did we look after our staff in the community during lockdown? We undertook a brilliant programme called Rebalance. I've got over 60 staff who work in various roles throughout this school. And we really engaged with all of the different elements that we found fearful. We looked at the elements of fear through Pasha and Yira from the um, Old Testament. And what is fear really like? We looked at unhooking ourselves from criticism if we felt in the virtual community criticism was coming forth. We looked at meditating as part of our daily rites and passage, a rite of passage. We considered how we could connect as a staff on a weekly basis. So every Friday that happened, a rebalanced curriculum. And all of my staff came through strong and everybody returned. I was so proud of them. We've continued that now onto a Sunday evening. Half past six on a Sunday evening, we open the Zoom and I'm there with my glass of gin and uh, we can have a little natter, a little catch up and just connecting again. Connecting is a big value. The next one I want to talk to you is about the parents. I always believed that parents should be on the inside of the school in order for us to really communicate and get to know them. And like many of you, I'm sure you opened your doors for your reception parents, your early years parents and so forth every morning. Well, actually, we're not able to do that right now. We have to have systems in place where children enter through different gates into the school. The impact has been incredible. Because senior leaders are engaging with the parents on the gates, we feel we're more connected with our community were able to nip everything in the bud straight away on the gate or just be there as a listening ear. The children feel far more secure leaving their parents at the gate. This has given us a whole new perspective on how we do things in school. Learning takes place immediately as soon as those children are through the gate. 
the atmosphere is much calmer. Parents feel secure too. That has been one of the biggest eye-openers for me, changing the way we engage with those parents in the morning and at the end of the day. What has this resulted on in? Deeper trust and parents really appreciating our kindness. Parents now speak about the kindness that they feel. And I feel that our values are actually more embedded in the community than they've ever been. The next one I want to talk to you about is Little Friday. One of my reception children said last week as he came through the gate, oh, Mrs. Reese, it's Little Friday today. So what's Little Friday? Well, we decided that along with connectedness, children needed consistency. So we are now closing the school on a Friday afternoon at one o'clock. This is our teacher's PPA time. They have Friday afternoon. Those children who cannot uh, go home, we do have people here to look after them and be with them for the whole afternoon. But Little Friday means that we all work really hard Friday morning. We are all focused. We have lunchtime together, but at one o'clock school ends. But what it also means is throughout the week, those children have consistency with their um, teachers there's no interruptions, no PPA being drawn out of the classrooms. Just three more, very quick, four more, really quickly. The seventh one I want to talk to you about is how I've really appreciated my job during lockdown. I loved my job before, but now I have such a deeper appreciation of the community that we have here at the school and, with, and the wider community. I have always quoted Krista McCauliffe's Quote, I touch the future I teach. And now more than ever, that resonates with me at such a powerful and deep level. To be able to be with the community and the children at this time and know that we're having an impact on how they're going to grow up in the future is really powerful. The eighth one, we ask, what's here now? We wanted the children to come back with our three core values respect, resilience, responsibility. But we want to ask what's here now? Where are they starting from? And what scaffolding do they need to ensure they make the progress from their baseline, not jumping in as to where we think they should be? Going forward, I'm always going to ask what is the purpose of what we're doing? I thought I used to do that before. But now I'm truly asking that question every time. And finally, I want to leave you on the fact that I believe our communities really, really need to be listened to and truly appreciated. I don't know whether I truly appreciated the impact that the whole community can have on our school. And I'm very, very grateful for the Values we've had embedded since I started here in 2006. It is a long journey that we're all on when we do values-based education, but the fruits have been there for the picking during this very, very challenging time. So that's my uh, presentation on perspectives in the community. Thank you, Sue. Thank you, Julie. How lovely and inspiring as always. Thank you so much. Um, Jason, can I invite you to talk to us? Jason is, is a real advocate of um, healthy eating in the community and uh, I'm sure he's going to be very inspiring too. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, Sue. Um, and thanks for all those presentations. Really good. And thank, uh, hopefully I'll be able to connect some of the, the thoughts that are going on. Um, just a point of note, it's actually World Food Day today as well. So we can be celebrating that. And my talk is about food education in general. So I want to expand a little bit on Shaji's image of gardening and Dom's about food, but also talk about food as a tool to support children's physical and mental well-being, which follows on from Sue's presentation there. Um, we're living through an unprecedented crisis in, in children's health across the world, um, largely caused by the food that children eat. Um, and also those mental aspects that come into that and you know, the physical um, content of that. So one in five UK children arrive at school aged four, already overweight. 
um, or obese. And by the time they move to secondary school, now year six here in the UK, it's one in three. Now, I often say if they were my maths or my literary figures, then I'd be out of a job. And child tooth decay is also on the rise with 45,000 British children admitted to hospital to have it, teeth extracted in 2017 and 18. So in these formative years of children's primary education from the ages of four to 11, nationally, children are developing habits and preferences that can lead them to acquiring serious health problems later on. And these are acquired health problems. These aren't things that you catch. Um, things like diabetes, type 2 diabetes, not type 1, type 2 diabetes, um, certain uh, cancers and heart disease are things that are from lifestyle choices. Now, of course, you know, this crisis has many causes. Fresh vegetables and, and other nutritious foods are expensive and many households don't have adequate cooking facilities. And we also live in a world that's flooded with aggressively marketed sugary foods and, um, and ad campaigns. Um, and I think we're becoming more aware that just giving out nutritional information in schools does not work as well as intended, you know, improving the children's health. You know, typically a lesson dealing with food in primary schools, that show the eat well plate or lessons around proteins or carbohydrates and fiber or a food diary sent home. Now I'm not passing any judgment on the schools about this. You know, there's very little guidance within our national curriculum in the UK regarding food. Um, at the moment, School Inspection Handbook just says you need to develop children's understanding of how to keep physically healthy, eat healthily and maintain an active lifestyle. That's the only sentence to do with children's health and well-being around food. Um, so if schools aren't inspected upon it, it doesn't become really a high priority in, in head teachers to incorporate it. In. But we are in a unique position to be able to provide incredible opportunities for children to engage with food. And these formative years are so crucial in forming that positive relationship with food. And what schools need to do is, is just a non-judgmental, easy access, simple way of engaging children in the pleasures of food. And that's sometimes taken out. We don't think about the pleasures of food, an area that all humans have a connection with. Now, a few, a few years ago, as part of research I was carrying out, I came across a a program called the SAPARE method, which is a, a sensory approach to food education. And the senses, one of the topics is covered in all early year settings. They, you start off with that, engaging with your senses. Um, and the, sen the SAPARE method teaches children about food by allowing them to explore different foods using their sight, hearing, touch, smell, and finally taste. A completely different way of engaging children in food. Um, in the 90s, it was developed further and parts, it went into the Swedish national curriculum through their national food agency and then on to Finland, where it's now part of their national curriculum. And it's a joint policy from the departments of education, health and agriculture. So imagine that. Well, that would be wonderful if governments and other countries, their agencies, had that joined up thinking. So as a result of that, myself and a food writer called B. Wilson, we set up with the support of guidance, guidance of SAPRE, an organization called Taste Ed. Um, and it's a whole program of study for the primary years aimed at children exploring food, the perfect way for children to find their own likes and dislikes. Um, we believe that teaching children about foods shouldn't simply be telling them which foods are healthy or unhealthy or mandating quantities of fruit and vegetables that eat each day. Instead, we want to harness children's natural curiosity by giving them fun opportunities to taste, touch, smell, listen, and talk about a variety of foods. And through these adventures to widen their preferences in, in a healthy direction. So with this solid foundation, the appreciation of food and children using mindfulness techniques to concentrate on just one of their senses, our children are now more engaged and enthused to look at other areas of food education. We have children going out every week to our school kitchen garden and polytunnel to engage in our vegetable and fruit growing curriculum. We grow heritage varieties of fruit and veg so that we can now include a sieve saving component to their learning and understanding of their growing of their own food. This year, we've saved all of our beans, tomatoes, peas, leeks, kale, cabbage and pumpkin seeds ready for next year's planting season. So the children can also visit our apiary and have hands on experiences of beekeeping. And we're keen, as in you know, what Richard will talk about this afternoon with the Harmony
ethos for the children to know where their food comes from and to be active participants in its growing and nurturing consumption. And during the, the UK lockdown, we also utilised our food kitchen, our school kitchen and cooked meals for the over 70s within our communities. We actually started this the week before schools were, were closed as the over 70s were told to self-isolate. And our community came together using the values base that we have in our school and we're delivering over 60 meals a day to very grateful residents. During the summer holidays, when our school gardens produce was not being used to supply our kitchen with food for our children's lunches, we made deliveries to the local food banks. And if we can remember way back in March and April of this year, after everyone had finished with toilet roll gate and the things, the next things to fly off the supermarket shelves were food items, pasta and flour and tin goods. The access to food had become a given. And when that was threatened, panic ensued. And at the same time, sea companies were seeing unprecedented demand for all things linked with growing your own fruit and veg. So it took a worldwide pandemic for people to understand the importance of the food system and also the joys and benefits that you can have having more elements of control over what you consume. So hopefully going forward, these lessons brought about out of fear will ensure that more children and their families appreciate the values that are associated with food education, such as simplicity appreciation, respect, patience, cooperation, curiosity, freedom, and joy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jason. That's really opened my eyes. I love the idea of this using this, the senses to explore food and get children enthused about it. And, and again, this, this common thread that's gone through all of you in this session of altruism, of looking after the community, of going out there, it's not just about what happens in school. You've all been a great inspiration. Uh, and I noticed we've, we've got three minutes before we end our session and hand over to Bridget. And we have one question that I've picked up um, from Kelvin. Uh, it's for you, Sharji. <laughs> Sorry, you're the, you're the one. Um, they're asking, um, do you consider imparting values to small groups of pupils who in turn can impart the same values to their fellow pupils? Um, I, I would say putting pupils in a leadership position. Are you happy to answer that, Shaji? Of course. Um, uh, ours is a big school with 1,400 children. And uh, they are from different communities, different languages. Because you know that English, India is secondary with uh, more than 14 official languages. So we have all kinds of communities in the school. I mean, religiously, socially, and also linguistically. We have different set of people. And the teachers are also the same. We have different linguistic people, different religious people. And that's the wonder, I mean, the beauty of the school. Teaching them values and bringing them to the same platform. You know, respecting each other's religious sentiments, respecting each other's social status. Everything was a challenge and uh, we have been doing it. And as I said, keeping that patience and doing it slowly, monitoring it, wherever you feel that, no, you have to change the plan, we change it and continuously in improving our own plans and that is the reason we uh, we said that you no know, more and more adults are involved the brighter and clearer the results are going to be thank, thank you i hope i, I answered thank you that. Shaji, you certainly did and that's another fascinating insight into how your school works it, it's just um fascinating fascinating to hear and those are some of the challenges that you talked about earlier today um i just have to say thank you so much to all of you all of our speakers you have been absolutely wonderful inspirations i know that there will be people going away from today who um, I, I just totally blown away by the work that's happening and the variety of work that's happening and how much you are including your community and reaching out. Neil Hawkes talks about schools being outward facing, and I think you're all fantastic advocates of that. So thank you very much indeed.
Thank you. Hello, everybody. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed this morning and I hope that you've been able to see, as I've seen, how the golden thread of values has helped to, us to weave a harmonious community from such diverse experiences. I personally love the emphasis that we've had today on values in action and the knowledge and the conviction of all our presenters today has been so inspiring. Um, their optimism, creativity, um, their wisdom, along with their compassion has just been contagious. So thank you so much. Deep thanks to all of you for today and for all that you're doing in your schools. I'd like to thank some people behind the scenes who have been um, so instrumental in putting this morning and the whole day together. And to make particular mention, please, to Pat Beachy and Nigel Cohen, Sue Jones, Lizzie Lewis, um, Richard Robinson, Sue Webb, Hannah Wilson, as well as all our speakers, our amazing hosts and workshop leaders. Um, it's been really humbling to be part of. And of course, thank you to all of you for being with us this morning. You've helped to make a sensational morning and we really thank you for all your contributions to the conference. Somebody in the chat earlier on said, gosh, I wish we could have this every week. And um, I know just what you mean because you feel so uplifted by it all. But we are actually putting on um, values-based webinars and um, our famous values meets. We're going to aim for um, once every half term. So look out for details of those because they're a beautiful way of enabling the values-based community to come together for uplift and reassurance and a renewed sense of purpose and optimism. So to finish, our wonderful session this morning, just to reiterate again, our renewed thanks to everyone who's contributed to this conference, to all the people listening, all the people commenting, all our workshop leaders, all the people working behind the scenes. And it's not over yet. So do join us this afternoon for our whole host of workshops that we've got. It's going to be like being in a values-based sweet shop because there's just so much to choose from. But I hope that you will stay and I hope that you'll um, have a great deal to take away from everything this afternoon. Thank you for being with us this morning. Mm -hmm.